And joining us now is Jay Sai Deepak. He's a lawyer at the Supreme Court and the Delhi High Court. He's also the author of two best-selling books. One of them is called India, that is Bharat. The other is called India, Bharat and Pakistan. So he knows more than a thing or two about what we're talking about right now. Sai Deepak, thank you very much for your time and for joining us here on India Today. My first question to you uh, uh, is, an, is for as an, an opening comment on the headline of the day, which was triggered by, you know, a small glimpse of an invitation issued by the president of the country, where the word Bharat was used instead of India. What did you think of that, first off? Frankly, I was extremely happy to see that. I wasn't sure if it was uh, for real or was it apocryphal, but it turns out that this could indeed be the case. And um, I think uh, quite a few framers of the con Constitution who were keen on naming this country Bharat or Bharat Varsha, uh, stand finally vindicated. I'm happy that this move has happened. While most people are bound to see this as a mere cosmetic move, I think naming as part of Bharatiya culture or Ramkarn is an extremely important act. And therefore, reversion to your cultural or your civilization name is a huge sign of self-confidence on the part of the civilization and, and the part of the Bharatiya state. I'm happy that finally this dispensation has done something which is long pending. Because, because, uh, uh, let's hope they're doing it. Yes, uh, Saidipak, because uh, apart from that invitation from the Rajapati Bhavan, there has been no announcement as such from the government itself. Uh, you know, most of what we've seen is uh, mostly speculation and extrapolation from that one image. Uh, uh, the title of one of yeah. your books is. Uh, you know, India, that is Bharat. That's the first line of uh, Article 1 of the Constitution, uh, 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 which, which very clearly yes. uh, mentions both India and Bharat. So the question arises, does any renaming even need to happen if India and Bharat both exist? Can't they be used interchangeably? So they are being used interchangeably. But mm. the fact of the matter is, when it was originally proposed, the draft provisions of exclusively of India then several amendments were proposed by members. I think even the father of uh, one of the uh, MPs from Puri, I think the uh, Pinaki Mishra's father, was among the ones to suggest amendments to the effect that India must be replaced either with Bharat or Bharat Varsha. Dr. Ambedkar worked at a compromise solution where he retained India and Bharat and he said India that is Bharat. Hmm. Despite that there were several disagreements to uh, the effect, that why should a country have two names? Why do we suffer from this? split personality or this multiple personality disorder, which of a self-respecting civilization continues to address itself and call itself by the name given to it by the colonizer. Now, I don't get in, I don't wish to get into the antecedents of it, but the consensus to a significant extent was that we should revert to either Hindustan or Bharat or Bharat Varsha. Bharat was deemed more appropriate, but Dr. Ambedkar chose to work out this particular solution. I don't think uh, it's a problem to use either interchangeably from an operational perspective, the larger meta question that I think we should be asking ourselves is why should we have two names in the first place? What is the purpose here? So are you saying that the government should move ahead and pass a resolution saying Bharat should be the official name of the country from now on and not India, India that two names should stop being the norm now? That's the book that if you do not even have the civilization confidence to revert to your original name, then what exactly are you conveying to the world in terms of your aspirations of becoming a Vishyo Guru? Second, I'm sure there are quite a few people who might say, Naam mein kya rakha hai, we should focus on development, so on and so forth. Every self-respecting civilization post-political independence has chosen to go back to its own roots, to its own culture. This civilization, which is perhaps the oldest, has not had the confidence to do so for the last 75 years. I'm happy that this too is happening. I wouldn't say that this is a be-all and end-all. Because at the end of the day, apart from the name, the spirit and the letter, both must go hand in hand. So let's hope that even the spirit of Bharat is restored to its original spirit. That there are those who will wonder about the implications of, you know, abruptly dropping a name like India, Sai Deepak. Uh, you, wouldn't there be a lot of work to do if you suddenly switch from India and Bharat to just Bharat? Nobody asked this question of the DMK when they changed from Madras to Chennai. Nobody asked this question of the Chivasena when they changed from Bombay to Mumbai. So why shouldn't it apply to the macro entity which is Bharat itself? What is the wrong about it? If people are comfortable giving all sorts of reasonable justifications for diversion to Kolkata, to Mumbai and to Chennai, why do they have a problem with India being reverted to Bharat?
Do you think that the government should go? Straight question. Do you think that the government should push ahead for something like this? You know, uh, 18th of September, 1949, that famous constituent assembly, Saidipak, you're very, you, you know, you're, you're deeply aware of that because you've written about it as well. Many people are reading yes. into the fact uh, that 18th September is when this special uh, uh, parliament session has also been called. You know, is that accidental? Uh, is that a message in itself? So that's one of the things that's led to a lot of speculation. Do you think the government should move ahead and take this to what you say is the best possible conclusion? See, you can be mischievous about it and say that had they fixed it on the 17th of September, it coincides with the Prime Minister of the top gentleman himself. <laughs> or you can even take a different view and say that this coincides with the liberation of the principal state of Hyderabad under Operation Polo. There is perhaps no date which is left in the calendar which is free of any kind of significance as far as Bharatiya yeah. history is concerned. 18th of September, I think, is a perfectly valid date. And most importantly, I think that this message is being sent through the platform of the G20, which I think is a fantastic message that's being sent, that we have the confidence to hold on to our roots and that we are drawing our name or we are taking it back, we are reclaiming it uh, back from the practice of the colonial history. I think it's a fantastic message to send. You know, one of the most vocal vocal sections, uh, uh, you know, in the wake of this story, having uh, broken today, Sai Deepak, uh, has been from the, the India Alliance, the opposition parties, who believe that this uh, entire move, even though the government hasn't made an announcement of any kind and there are no indications that one is forthcoming, uh, that this entire right. headline, this all this buzz and speculation, uh, you know, is a is a, a little bit of kite flying by the government in response to right. the opposition bloc calling themselves India. What do you think about that? See, frankly speaking, while I don't necessarily, I'm not exactly uh, a votary for everything that the BJP does because mm. I'm independent. The headlines certainly seems to have converted the opposition into a bunch of headless chickens. Because frankly, if they had some sense of political maturity, sagacity, and wisdom or even based on that matter, they would embrace this and focus on actual issues which they could perhaps pin, the, pin down the government on. All these days, they've been keen about pressing the Adani issue, they've been keen about pressing the Manipur issue and whatnot. Why don't they stick to those topics which according to them are relevant instead of falling prey to what they call as a diversity tactic on behalf of the government or on the part of the government? Hmm. If you're serious about it, why would you want to get mired in this kind of an issue? Focus on what you think is important. But no, when you were given an opportunity to discuss Manipur on the floor of the parliament, you chose to stay to walk out. So with what moral authority can you actually accuse anybody else of having indulged in a diversity tactic? If I were in the shoes of the opposition, I would continue to press those issues, which I believe are important to national interest, as opposed to making this issue or other this non-issue into an issue. So you firmly believe it is not a diversionary tactic in this political atmosphere? I See, for unfortunately, they don't teach us the ability to read people's minds as part of... Uh, with a law school training, so I can I don't know whether this was meant to be diversionary or not. I am going to ask myself the simple question: even if it is diversionary, so what? Hmm. Does it bode well for the country's statement as an independent sovereign power, which is asserting itself in the global stage? If the answer is a yes, whether it's diversionary or not is secondary to me. It has no consequence to me. It makes no difference to my life. Okay, let's put the the, the Bharat issue aside for a second, uh, uh, Sai Deepak, and. Uh, deal with the second big headline of the week, uh, you know, that you've also been speaking about. And that is a comment that was made by Udaynidhi Stalin, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you've already seen right. about Sanatana Dharma, right. where he, uh, where, right. you know, just for the benefit of our viewers, he said it should be eradicated like malaria and dengue and I think COVID as well. Right. What did you think about right. that, that comment? Because he's been defiant. He said that I did not mean Hinduism or Hindus, I meant the caste system yes. and nobody can make me retract my statement. I think that untrained, unlettered scion of the DMK family, not the party, has bitten off more than he can chew. And he will certainly face the consequence for it, politically, legally and socially. And it's important that he faces the consequence of it. Because notwithstanding the fact that his statement is absolutely consistent, with the anti-national, anti-Bharat, anti-Hindu DNA of the DMK. It's time that this issue got traction. Because as much as people know about the exodus of the post exodus of Kashmiri Pandits and Kashmiri Hindus from the valley under the uh, threat of the gun, people don't know the conditions in which Hindus live in the state of Tamil Nadu under uh, a rabidly fascist brevidimist uh, regime. Because ultimately, if you go to the history of the origins of this, this regime or this ideology, so to speak, their ideologue, their founder, Ive Ramaswamy, toured 
Europe before he founded the Dra- the Dravida Kalagam which is the social organization founded by him and he drew significantly from the fascists of Italy and from the Nazis of Germany hmm. or rather at least the far right ideologies that were prevalent at that particular point of time Nazis were still not in existence around that period so the point i'm trying to make is PMK is revealing its true uh, neo nazi fascist tendencies because it has a tendency to attack the softest possible punching back in the history of modern independent bharatiya republic which is hindus do, do you do you think the reaction to what he said uh, should have been greater than what it has because one one side of the without a doubt what, what do you think should have happened what do you think needs to happen at the very least uh, when people who took umbrage to what the tigress nupur sharma said on television mm. should have uh, perhaps uh, meted out the very same treatment in terms of legally prosecuting this particular gentleman and most importantly even if i don't have any kind of expectations from let's say free agents and independent individuals i would certainly have an expectation from the judiciary which was happy taking so much of cognizance of quite a few statements when those statements affected other communities yeah. here's a statement that's been issued by a political functionary a cabinet minister of a particular state who's sworn an oath on the constitution and he has issued a statement against 80% of the population of this country hopefully we are still 80% and i hope the supreme court takes so much of cognizance of this system of this particular instance as well because that would mean for or restore the confidence of people in the independence of the judiciary and the independence you know sai deepak uh, among the many reactions that have come out to uh, to uh, either justify what udayanidhi stalin has said or to uh, shield him from the harsh comments that have been coming his way is that sanatana dharma the way it is understood in um, tamil nadu is the caste system so you can't spin it any other way and you can't blame udayanidhi for saying something which is a sentiment that is prevalent uh, you know in dravidian politics how would you respond to that because every time he's been confronted with uh, you know the, uh, the the criticism of his comments he said i meant the caste system is this the caste system that he was talking about thank you i think it's it's a it's a load of hogwash for me for french but all these justifications let him offer this in a court of law because when he made the statement it had no caveat it had no explanation it had no disclaimer hmm. so these uh, exposed facto justifications don't hold water they don't cut ice let him answer and submit himself to a court of law as and when he is called up in a court of law for the statement that he has made do you think it was a coincidence what uh... Uh, that that he said sanatan dharma and not anything else Absolutely he didn't keep not. it general he specifically to chose together. to say sanatan dharma see people are focusing only on his statement forgetting the fact that the the platform that was put together itself was dedicated to the eradication of sanatan dharma hmm. and it was populated by the likes of uh, dravida kargam said mr veeramani not just that the minister of the hrc department which is the hindu religious and charitable endowment department of tamil nadu who hmm. was wearing saffron himself and sporting a kumkumam yeah. shouldn't have shared space on this particular platform this is exactly why i believe that anyone who does not have any kind of faith in the uh, hindu society so to speak or in the hindu way of life or does not even have respect for it should not wield or should not hold the particular position hmm. the hrc position is not a secular position it is a position in relation to a religious body if you don't respect us then please vacate the particular position and respectfully get out you, you've seen very cursory comments coming in from uh, you know the dmk's uh, larger larger pool of allies under the india alliance Uh, did you think any of them were uh, worthy criticisms of what udayanidhi stalin has said or were they just placeholders they just needed to be said he let's not forget the fact that both national parties at some point or the other have knowing fully well the antecedents of the dmk been coalition partners with them so i do not yeah. want to take a position here which Mr. Sir Blame entirely on one particular national party and the fact of the matter is for several years this particular party was uh, was a trusted uh, ally, alliance partner of the NDA also hmm. so i genuinely hope when we speak of principle when we speak of ideology when we speak of civilization we do not sacrifice all of this at the altar of political expediency either in the foreseeable future or in the long term future because public memory is short so it's important that i highlight that this aspect also do, do you think there's going to be uh, any political fallout we are in election uh, in a big election year this year next year uh, you know tamil nadu thereafter as well do you think there is going to be some political fallout to what udayanidhi stalin said 
or is it going to be a storm in a teacup headlines for a week and then gone when you speak of a political fallout it's important to focus on two different aspects one whether there will be a political fallout within the state of tamil nadu hmm. second will there be a political fallout outside the state of tamil nadu my limited understanding is that it will certainly have a political implication outside the state of tamil nadu but within the state of tamil nadu it remains to be seen whether the central bjp and the state bjp take this as seriously as possible and prosecute this gentleman to the logical conclusion so that he regrets and repents having made this political statement which has offended the sentiment of practicing hindus within and outside tamil nadu this, so so you're saying that the 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 impact within tamil nadu is not really known just now you're saying that it because there are some people who believe that udayanidhi stalin's comments uh, you know may have awakened some latent sentiments within the state as well absolutely i don't deny that In, to that extent uh, i'm i'm grateful to this uh, to this to this uh, unlettered sky for having set the ball rolling because this is a conversation that was long waiting to happen i've said this with pernicious cancer has infected indian political discourse and while people constantly speak of kashmiri separatism we don't understand the pernicious consequences of the jabrilist cancer and it has managed to take over one of the most important civilizationally important states which is tamil nadu and i hope we do not let it spill over into other important parts of bharat it needs to be curbed and it certainly needs to be put in place and cut to size do you think a comment of this kind last question uh, uh, sai deepak do you think a question of the a uh, uh, comment of this kind has the potential to become a larger election issue i don't know i'm not a psychologist i generally don't know but if uh, somebody really wants to shake up the established political order and political discourse of tamil nadu then i would say udayanidhi stalin has presented a fantastic opportunity on a platinum platter and i hope people who are followers and uh, let's say devotees of chanakya niti apply chanakya niti for once and uh, hope to change the status quo the capacity of uh, tamil nadu's political calculus using this as an opportunity it's important that this is done because i believe that politics is a is a means or a medium for civilization good ultimately the politics is meant to be under the dharmic understanding of that niti and he has given an opportunity to reopen this entire conversation as to the legitimacy of the dravidian discord and how it has survived under the rubric of free speech by skewing venom against the civilization against the native faith systems of this land that needs to be called out asap j sai deepak pleasure speaking to you thank you for speaking to india today thank you thank you thank you if you like the video do like comment share and subscribe